You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. For almost five years, the future of the Cincinnati Riverfront has been the number one local issue on the minds of politicians and most of the public. The good news is that things are moving forward. The rebuilding of Fort Washington Way is on schedule and moving fast enough that everybody can see the progress. Cranes at Paul Brown Stadium methodically hoist huge buckets of concrete as the first of two new sports stadiums rises out of the ground. Although nothing physical is happening at the wedge site, architects are working on the conceptual designs. The issue remains what happens between these two bookends. Since early February, a 16-member ad Riverfront Advisory Commission has been working on developing a plan for the Cincinnati Riverfront. Originally, the committee was supposed to submit its report by the end of June, but asked for an extension and is now aiming for a report in mid-September. The chairman of that commission is Jack Rouse. Jack is the head of Jack Rouse Associates, which designs museums, amusement parks, and other en entertainment venues. Back in February, as the Riverfront Commission got started, Jack was here on Newsmakers to share his hopes. He joins me this morning to catch up on the progress of the commission. Jack, welcome back to Newsmakers. Thank you. Um, one of the things that you said back in February was that you wanted to hear from the people, and you held a series of open yep. meetings. What is it that you heard that actually had some impact on the design that you're developing? Well, the first thing we heard that perhaps didn't impact directly the design, but impacted our spirit to continue uh, with vigor on this, is that people want a reason to go back downtown. I mean, nobody's fooled by the fact that downtown isn't as vibrant as it should be, but whether you talk to the people in northern Kentucky or in Westchester or the suburbs or North Avondale, people want a compelling reason to go back downtown and they want a compelling reason to reconnect with the river. If we heard one thing over and over again, it was connect to the river, connect to the river, connect to our past. And what does that mean? Past. What does connect to the river mean well, in concrete terms as you're developing this plan? Well, obviously the river floods, so uh, you know th this is not a question of building something on a placid lake. On the other hand, uh, we have been cut off from the river by Fort Washington Way for a long time, and I think it means I think it means in design terms, stepping up from the river plain through a series of parks and green spaces, if you will, to some low or mid-rise developments that then eventually transist into the city and that that park feeling doesn't just stop when you get to the area we're supposedly concentrating on, but it, it continues to move north of 3rd Street so that there is a sense of the central business district and the riverfront as being one. It has not been that way in the past, as you all know. You know, we went down there, we'd go to the game, we'd go back, we'd go home. Well, when you say even north of 3rd Street, I'm trying to imagine what that might mean. Now, at an earlier stage, when Keep Fort, imagining. Washington, <laughs> Fort Washington Way was being dreamt about, mm -hmm. one of the proposals was that it could actually be uh, uh, roofed over and yep. at the top be turned into Green park, air, park area. Is that still a possibility? Absolutely. It as, is. A, as a matter of fact, from an engineering standpoint, the, uh, a lot of the structures were designed in order to take the lids, if you will. And uh, there are models for this in many other cities in terms of taking... What, taking what would it cost? I think the cost per per lid per block is per in the, block. is in is in the ten million dollar range, something like that. Okay, that's what I've heard in the past yeah, when yeah. In, yeah. with the uh, with the Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Yeah. And do you think anybody's interested in raising ten million dollars per block to cover that? I, I, is that a recommendation that you're going to make? Yeah, 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 yeah. You heard it here. Okay. Uh, it, it's not a question, I think, and this has been the problem. Is this worth $10 million? Is this worth $2 million? Is this worth $50 million? The question is, if the whole thing isn't done and made attractive, the underlying real estate values, the uh, 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 leasable space downtown, the desire of people to live down, it is all going to fall apart anyway. So it's not a question of can we afford it, I think. I mean, certainly that's an issue. I'm not being Pollyannish about it. But the question is, if we don't look at the totality and keep looking at just the pieces, you know, we can afford this tree, but we can't afford that lid, this does not a great urban neighborhood fabric make. You know, and it, it's, you know, we've suffered because of no master plan. You and I have talked about this the last time. Right. Right. And, and we're going to try to get one this time. Well, you know, there have been. There have been. Matt, you're and right, we were you're talking right. about this a yeah. little bit before we went on the show. Yeah. And as a historian, 1948, 
uh, master plan. See, you weren't alive in 48, 68. though, and I was. So I, uh, yeah. And while I was actually, I was alive in 48. <laughs> scary, isn't it? Um, but anyway, the the point is, could you learn anything from those oh. old plans? Well, it hasn't been, you know, as you know, our firm does a lot of museum work, so this whole history thing is compelling to me anyway. But if you go back to the first one that, you know, we can sort of put our hands on, the 1948 master plan, three things pop out of that that have continued to pop out of every master plan since then. Residential, park spaces, places for entertainment, and they didn't know the word convention center in those days, but, you know, for gatherings. And it's, it happened in 48, it happened in the 50s, it happened in the 60s, it happened in the 70s, in the 80s, and it's gonna, you're going to hear it again. What does this tell us? Well, the comforting fact is that, you know, uh, good ideas, I don't think, die and should not die. And, you know, if we didn't listen 51 years ago, you know, maybe now, after 50 years of hearing the same record, so that, we're ready to. What you're saying is there are certain things that keep coming back. Let's talk about some of those. Absolutely. Residential. Is that going to be a part Always. of your recommendation? Absolutely, absolutely. Get people living down on the riverfront area, there is below 3rd no, Street? There is no way on God's earth that you can create a vibrant downtown if people don't live downtown. It just doesn't happen. I mean, you know, all the bricks and mortar and landscape and water features in the world do not create vibrancy. Vibrancy is created by other people. Ironically, safety is created by other people. The safest environment is a populated environment, not a deserted environment. So all of these things work together, and, and absolutely residential south of Sturd Street. I mean, what kind of residential? Are we talking high-rise residential? Are we not high-rise. I mean, not 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 another Lytle Tower. As you know, at okay. one time there were supposed to be three of those, right. as I recall. Uh, no, because again, it, it, it is a, from a design standpoint, it's a question of scale. You, I mean, the river establishes the baseline, if you will, the park system as it moves up, and then our b buildings, which, you know, gosh, probably the highest may be eight, ten stories, okay. and that wouldn't be a whole building. That would just be things that, you know, pierce stick out, up as stick part of a building. There. But it needs to have a very neighborhood feel to it. How many it? people would you imagine living on the riverfront uh, when this is, if this is fully implemented? You know, I, I wish I had looked at that statistic before I came, but it's well in the hundreds. I mean, as okay. you know from the DCI studies, uh, the demand for downtown residential far exceeds the supply. Absolutely. And the model for some of this, everyone says, well, look what they're doing in Charleston, look what they're doing in Portland, look right. what they're doing in, uh, in San Antonio. I would submit, go walk down Pyatt Park. You know, we don't have to go to Charleston or Portland. You know, and that, that model, which is very European and frankly has existed for a few thousand years, so it maybe has stood the test of time, <laughs> of uh, retail and shops on the first floor and residential above and a lot of green space in front and around is exactly what's happened on Garfield Place around Pyatt Okay, Park. residential is one that yeah, is going, you're going to recommend. Absolutely. Commercial. One of the things that keeps coming back, that the, the one thing that keeps getting mentioned is some sort of Hofbrau house or beer hall or something. I know. Is the, the beer party on the river. The yeah. beer party on the river. Is that, is that the answer, or is that part of the answer? What is that? Well, one thing that came out of all of this is there is no silver bullet answer. Uh, ten years ago, when cities were going through this, they thought there was. And the answer was put in a multiplex, put in a Planet Hollywood, put in a Dave and & Buster's, and put in a Sega Gameworks, and you'll all live happily ever after. Well, most of them didn't live happily ever after long enough to pay off the debt on the initial investment because those models simply didn't work. And the reason they didn't work is there was absolutely no connection to the city. You know, outside of Hollywood, Planet Hollywood doesn't mean a heck of a lot in Des Moines. You know, and once you've gone, you've gone. Forget the fact that they didn't have very good food and that the theming wasn't great either. But the, the, the Hofbrau House, you know, keeps coming back, and I think it's a symbolic return for two reasons. First of all, we do have a German heritage. Uh, Maybe that's overstated. You and I have talked about this right. you know, at other times. And, and the second thing is that it is a developer who has stepped up to the plate and said he would like to be in Cincinnati. But it is only a symbol of, I think, the kind of food slash entertainment um, mixed-use uh, venue that could just as easily be said about a, a soul and gospel center or a blues and jazz center. Uh, put whatever name you want and on it. And could multiple ones, is it oh, one yes, or the yeah, other? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's not one or other. There, there's there been a, a couple of studies, one done by Norm Miller, who's uh, with the university, who's on our commission, that, that talks about the ability of the downtown area to absorb different kinds of restaurants. I mean, the restaurant business is a fickle business. It's, it's, it's right. a horrible business to be in, I would think. On the other hand, you know, there is a need or, or, or an opportunity, I think, to absorb several of these, okay. in addition to smaller boutique, you know, facilities. You know, one of the things that is moving forward uh, 
is the design on the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. And in fact, uh, several weeks ago, a couple of their preliminary drawings were released. Right. Um, how much has your commission been in touch with that process? Continually. 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 Are you happy with the designs yep. that you see? Yep. Uh, let me mention one thing. Everyone has talked consistently about what we do between the two stadiums, as if the only thing that existed on the Ohio side of the river were two stadiums. Let me deal with the north part of this. We have four major anchors on the river when this is all done. Okay. We have the Bengals, we have the Reds, we have the Freedom Center, and we have First Star. All of those generate attendance. And let's face it, to make anything work, you've got to generate attendance. More importantly, you have to generate repeat attendance from the core. All of those do that. The Bengals, obviously, during their season, the Reds during their season, the Underground Railroad uh, Freedom Center on a continuing basis. And, I, you know, some people forget the fact that First Star generates more event days than all the others put together, and it generates different kinds of events because the audience that goes to uh, uh, World Federation Wrestling or whatever it's called, obviously I don't go, at the First Star is not the same audience that goes to a country Western star uh, concert. And so you're, you're generating you get different, different kinds. different types of yeah. people. They're and, not and, all just baseball fans or football fans. And, and the point of what's going on, huh. I think, between these is to create a dynamic that people don't go to First Star and then go home, but then go to First Star and move through the development. And whether that shops or retails or nightclubs or bars have an opportunity to do. Right now, we go to the river and we go home. Point number two, this is not about the northern side of the river. This is about the region. For And have you been able to deal with the people on, in Covington? And New not York? only deal with, they've been active participants. Okay. You know, one of our first forums was held in northern Kentucky. Uh, you, you can't ignore the fact, because the public doesn't, that there's an aquarium over there, an IMAX complex over there, parking over there. I'm glad we haven't talked about the P word so far today. We will. Oh, God. Uh, and, and, and a lot of residential going on over there. This is a regional thing. The public doesn't draw a line in the Ohio and say, I'm only going to spend my money in Ohio because I live in Cincinnati. That's silly. Well, let's talk about the P word. No, oh, I knew you were going to do this. Let's oh. talk about the P word because parking right now, I think people who work downtown know just how hard parking it's is. It's horrible. It's horrible. And parking has always been said to be an integral part of this for a whole bunch of reasons. Because it's parking and because it's also platforms for other development. Have your, has your commission, when it's looked at the parking, decided to make significant changes? Let me back up a little bit. Okay. Um, the, this report of ours, which could probably choke a horse, uh, is dealing with all kinds of things that I think we never thought we'd get into, one of which is accessibility and a, a section, a chapter we're calling the behavioral aspects of parking. Now, what does that mean? You know. We, we say parking, but what we're really talking about is access. You know, uh, take Manhattan as an extreme example. Nobody in Manhattan parks near Broadway if they're going to the show. They take a taxi or they take a subway. And the same model exists in a lot of other cities. So it's not just about parking. It's a question about having affordable and convenient access to where you work, to where you recreate, or where you live. Is parking a component? Absolutely. Is parking expensive? Absolutely. Does anyone want to talk about it? No. Just to, to remind people, how much does in a structured parking? Oh, 10,000 plus. 10,000 plus, per, yeah, I've heard 20,000, but slot. that's okay, yeah. per slot, just yeah. to remind people how expensive well, this, this is. Yeah, and, and, and it's something that, I mean, you have to have it. I mean, let's face it, if people can't get to your venue, your venue's going to die. So and are we going to have this whole row of parking garages built into the elevated uh, second street? Well, the, a lot of the parking is below grade. Remember, everything's right. coming up to the 415 level, which right. is the current plaza 415 level. feet above sea above level. Above sea level, sorry. That's right. And, uh, and a lot of that is underneath. There are some in the original plan structures that we're poking up above. Now, some of those can be wrapped. Some of that parking can perhaps be moved north of 3rd Street. Some of it could be dealt with in the current structure that's uh, under design between Lytle and uh, One Lytle Place and the, and the First Star Center. There, there are other ways to skin the parking cat other than just dumping a bunch of cars on the riverfront. I mean, th that'd be easy. Frankly, if we could have recommended that, I could have gone back to my real job six months ago. Yeah. But that's not the answer. It's not the right answer. It's an answer. We know we're all out of time for this segment, but can you stay for another segment? No, another sure. 10 minutes? Okay, sure. stay right there. We're going to yeah. change plans. Now, stay tuned. Jack Rouse will be right back, and we'll talk about a few more things that we haven't gotten a chance to cover and how to implement whatever plan is presented.
Welcome back. Jack, um, one of the things that some people have talked about is the idea that your commission might come up with sort of a signature element. Gee, we've, we're talking about the Millennium Monument in Newport, <laughs> which I don't want to express my feelings about, but uh, is are the St. Louis Arch or the Statue of Liberty or a signature monument that would help people identify this as Cincinnati? Um, is that a direction you're going in? No. Um, certainly there needs to be a visual, a strong visual identity. Um, we already got an Eiffel Tower. Well, we got one in Paris and we got one in Kings Island, so we got two Eiffel Towers. St. Louis has the arch. What we have, I think, that has been greatly, greatly uh, under, uh, misunderstood and certainly undervalued uh, is the Roebling Suspension Bridge, which is a m masterpiece of design and architecture and engineering. Right. I mean, set aside the fact that it's the prototype of the Brooklyn Bridge, it is, in fact, an incredible piece of architecture. When the site gets developed the way that, and th by the way, this is a very difficult site to understand. Those of us who do sites for a living have a hard time understanding this. You know, it's enormously complicated. But when that gets done, the image of the Roebling Suspension Bridge crossing the river into the green space, terminating at the Freedom Center, that's the postcard. That low-rise uh, urban neighborhood development with the suspension bridge moving into the Freedom Center, that's what wants to define this region. So I we don't, don't have to think anything up new. We've well, got it. Why? I mean, why, well, okay. first of all, why build another arch? But uh, right. those things come and go. I mean, gosh, Spokane went through it. Toronto went through it. I mean, do we need sky towers or three? I don't think so. Okay. You know, you know one, of the thing, one of the other areas that you and I talked about back in February, I, I raised the question about, gee, were you worried about the political uh, political, the you know the political controversy that seems to sur surround this, and you you at the time you said nah, you, Very know, you weren't worried about it. You dealt with a lot of corporations. You understood small p politics. You could, what have you learned? I didn't say small p, but I that's my okay. Word. Your word, okay. What, what have I learned? What have you learned? Um, Has it been harder than you thought? In, in, in some ways, yes. I mean, clearly the 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 history of the, of of the riverfront and of development in this town, you know, has had some stumbling blocks along the way. I will say that the city and the county has been nothing but cooperative. I mean, it has not been a difficult job because there were roadblocks thrown in our way. They've given us the staff support that we requested, and that couldn't have been better. The difficulty is that, that what we are recommending is probably not going to be able to be implemented within the confines of the same old, same old way of doing and business. And let's talk about that because you have already said that you thought some new entity had to be created. Well, I, I said uh, that sort or of. What did you? What let, do you let, let me say what I what I said, not what was necessarily written. Uh, it is clear that a different approach is going to have to be taken to make it to make all this work. Now. Whether the entity already exists and has to be reconstituted or reformulated or redefined or whether a new entity has to be put in place, I mean, th that will all, I think, come out in the report and, frankly, in the weeks or months that follow the report. Because I, I think any city, any development is finding, you know, that if you're going to, I hate to be cliche, move into the next millennium, that, in fact, you're probably not going to be able to do it under the same ground rules as the old millennium, particularly in a city that has had a history of flat development, flat rates downtown, flat po negative population growth, as I remember from the oh, paper. Oh, absolutely. You know, Since in, 1950. In, 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 in the okay, that's a fairly long period of time of negative okay. growth. Oh, yeah. Somewhere in that, you may get the message that the way we've been doing it is maybe not the way we should be doing it in the future. How is this related, though, to a proposal uh, by Roxanne and Phil, as I remember, about uh, six weeks, two months ago, that maybe downtown development in general needed to be put into the hands, taken out of the hands of economic development and put in the hands of some semi-autonomous group that had its own, well, it's, it, it, could that be the same thing? I think it could be. I mean, certainly that's, there's a model for that in a lot of other cities. I so mean, what we're now saying... Now that involves, I mean, but this is, shows the complexity of That involves state, I mean, that involves rewriting some rules and regulations. Right. Well, isn't that what government's supposed to do? Rewrite rules and regulations to make our lives better and easier to live? And we keep talking about the city and the county must come up with the money. Whose money is it anyway? You know, I mean, I, I think part of the reasons for our forums and our follow-ups forums is, is, is that we want to make sure that we're recommending what, what the folks out there who live here want. You know, and that's not going to, I think, be able to be implemented under the system we currently have. So that tells us something. That, I mean, this is broader than the riverfront. This tells us something about government at the end of the 20th century. I think is so. not effective. Is that, is that I, what we're I, saying? Well, yeah. Uh, that's, Let's that, be that, blunt. That's what you, okay. All right. 
there are certainly some forms of government at the end of the 20th century that aren't being as responsive to the needs of the people as they could. And absolutely, this is more than about the eight blocks on the riverfront. Listen, the 16 of us, you know, could have made a recommendation in March uh, to put a, a Cineplex and a Dave and Buster's down there, all gone home. That isn't the answer. But as soon as you start looking at what the answer really is and bridging into the region and bridging into the CBD and figuring out the funding mechanism and what's going to attract developers and what's going to be inclusive for all of our citizens, it gets way, way beyond what you build on eight blocks. Well, let's, let's take a, let, raise two questions here. What about the impact of what you're going to propose on the CBD, a central business district? And in fact, is your plan going to openly talk about that, or yes. is that just going to yes. be behind nope. the scenes? No, 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 no. We cannot compete with the Central Business District. We must help the Central Business District become, you know, more vital and more alive. And I think, as we talked earlier, this whole green space movement, in, in, whether it's symbolically or actually, to connect the CBD with the riverfront, we've had two. De they haven't been dueling, but we've had two. We've had two downtowns. You know, we've had the stuff south of Fort Washington Way and the stuff north of Fort Worth Third. And we have to pull that together. We, we can't compete with the CDB. That's the, that's the high-rise office towers. That's the high-rise residentials. That's everything that we've come to know as the CBD. There's a whole nother element, that neighborhood fabric that we're going to want to create. Do you touch on the issue that sort of has seemingly been on the minds of uh, the city administration mm -hmm. in recent years about uh, a new fourth department store, a Nordstrom's or who knows what, and where it should no. be and how it should connect to the riverfront. Because yeah. the understanding at one point was that Nordstrom was only inter inter interested if it could directly connect over 3rd Street or at 3rd Street to the new riverfront development. We, we have stayed away from, uh, from that only because it was very apparent early on that any large department store or what in the trades called black box development was not appropriate on the riverfront. Do we need a Nordstrom's in the downtown area? I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the face of retailing vis-a-vis -vis the Internet is so complex, and, I mean, it changes every week and a half. Uh, who knows what the future of department stores is going to Forget Nordstrom's, forget Cincinnati. I mean, what's that whole model going to look like in a decade? I guarantee you that's not going to look the way it looks now. Okay. It can't. So you know, either that or a lot of people building, don't want it. We may be building for the 1980s rather than from, for the 2000s. Well, I'm not saying that... Yeah, I yeah, said that. Yeah, Don't you worry said that. about it. You said that. I mean, <laughs> but I think you, you can't look at, at the development of something like a, a department store and not read the newspapers about what's happening with e-commerce. I mean, right. that is the very heart of that business, you know. Uh, that's why we're not recommending any of it for the riverfront. A couple we're of things here. Um, what is it that you're most concerned about as you wrap up over the next four weeks or whatever, six weeks, whatever it is, you wrap up your report. What is it that you're most concerned about once that report is issued? That we end up on the shelf. That we end up like the 1948 report. And I'm very serious about that. I mean, the, 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 the last section of our report is called Keeping the Vision Alive. And yeah, that's about feel good and emotionally keeping the vision alive. But it's also about administratively and developmentally and operationally keeping the vision alive. You know, I, it, it's not that writing the story, which of course is where we started, and then developing the design vocabulary, which is what came next, uh, is the easy part. But it is a part that we as a commission could, could deal with. The next parts, the development part, the economic part, and the passion part. I, I, I guess I need to underscore that because, you know, none of these things really work unless you have a group or an individual who is really going to be passionate about this and just not let it die. I mean, it's what happened in 42nd Street. It's what's happened in Charlotte. It's what's happened in every city. And that's why you're proposing this new... Well, that from, yeah, from one standpoint. But I think there's... there, there, there has to be somebody there, else there, who there, there's, a, and there's a layer of passion in that, too. And, and I think that, you know... We've all been very, very concerned about that. Well, one of the things about passion is that the people of the city have to, have to own it. And my understanding is you're going to take this back to the people yes, just sir. where you started yep. uh, before you issue the report. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, uh, sometime here around the middle of August, uh, we're going to be doing a couple more open forums to let people know in very general terms the sorts of things that we've heard and the sort of solutions we're recommending. because. It is, a, it is an initiative. I mean, it has been a grassroots initiative. This hasn't been 16 people that locked themselves in a room in a hotel and came up with a plan. Mm -hmm. uh, that has happened in the past. That is not what happened this time.
Well, two things. One, as those dates and places for those meetings get clarified, let us know. We'll, we'll, let, we'll let people know. And two, hope you'll come back right after the uh, report is issued and we can talk about the details. We'll do it. Thank you. Okay. okay. Take care. Very good. Thank you for joining us on Newsmakers this morning and join us again next Sunday when we'll be joined by the men and women who are shaping our community for the future. Have a good week.